I'd like to thank you for the invite and to say good evening to everybody. Um, Tom Mann's a name that most activists have heard of, but they know little about. Yet between 1889 and 1941, he was probably the best known trade unionist in the world. So much so that when he died, the flags flew half mast in Australia and the red flag was flown over Melbourne Town Hall. So if you've come to tonight's meeting to find out about him, I hope not to disappoint you. And I hope you go away with a desire to find out more. I only ask that you ask yourself as I go through this, how it was all done without Zoom, the web, for most of his life without telephones, without WhatsApp, Facebook, personal cars, or aeroplanes. When studying history, Marxists seek out processes and themes rather than events and things. And in Tom Mann, there's a rich abundance of both because he was there at the beginning and the close of most of the post-Chartist chapters of the modern labor movement. The Communist Party's centenary has been a time of renovation, but also of rediscovery. I'm thinking about the recent work of people like Dave Horsley, who's been studying black British communists, or the work done by Graham Stevenson around Jesse Eden. And it's allowed us to revisit our origins and our aims. What were the roots of the Communist Party? Did our origins come from within the deep grooves that make up the line from the corresponding societies that goes to the Chartists and the First and Second Internationals? I think there's some validity to this claim in the life path of Tom Mann, but it's not a straight line and the party has struggled with this issue. Why should we be concerned with a man that died 79 years ago? Well, I think principally it's because of the impact of his ideas and the way they became embedded into the structures of the labor movement, the unions, the labor party and the communist party. Mann was born in war and he died in it. Um, he was born shortly with troops returning from the Crimean War and died shortly before Operation Barbarossa when Hitler invaded the USSR. And he witnessed an enormous degree of change in his life. As Damon said, he was born in 1856 uh, in Foles Hill, just north of Coventry. His mum died when he was two and he left school at nine to work in the fields, then in coal mining between the ages of 10 and 14, where he dragged what was called bullock overburden with a chain fastened to his waist. A colliery fire resulted in him being bonded to a tool making firm in Birmingham, where he worked a 60 hour week, a 60 hour, six day week. His introduction to working life was medieval. Man was a restless figure, a prolific letter writer, an organizer, a thinker doer, and an orator. Henry Hindman, leader of the SDF, who wasn't very free with his compliments about anyone, described man's speeches as full of fire. Every word was as clear as a bell. Action to the word, word to the action. Man taught himself violin, numerous languages, including Russian when he was over 60. He studied astronomy at night school and co-founded the Shakespeare Mutual Improvement Society. He became a, a lifelong champion of the eight hour day. In his view, an eight hour day might lighten the burden of workers, but he saw in it a schema for reorganizing society. Eight hours for work, yes, but also eight hours for rest and eight hours for restituting family, community and working class life. As a tool maker, he was a prince amongst engineers and a, and a society member. He came to work in London as a journalist, having uncovered appalling working conditions at salt mines in Cheshire. He tried to write an article but was blocked from getting information. So he simply put on his old work clothes, tramped to Cheshire, took a job as a labourer 
and wrote under the false name of Joe Millet, and his reports caused a sensation at the time. Increasingly, his life became associated with docklands and seafaring. Those who attach their working lives to the sea tend to a broader view of the world. The culture of ports, of citizens of port cities, look outwards as much as in. It's not just a broader view of the world, they have the world in them. They're raised on history and tales, often of places and things they might never see. He had lifelong attachments and friendships that endured and went on despite the most serious political differences. His only uh, terminal fallout was with John Burns, but he had friendships lifelong with Ben Tillett, Prince Peter Kropotkin, Harry Pollitt, the US miners leader, Big Bill Hayward, Irishman Jim Larkin and James Connolly. He understood that in the workers movement, you have to learn to disagree without taking out the man or the woman. It's a lesson that could be better learned today. Mann was heavily influenced by Gladstone's second reforming ministry, which deserves a lot more study by revolutionaries today. It set up famously royal commissions into housing, music, municipal sanitation and technical education. That was a commission dominated by William Morris. And this was uh, Gladstone's way of responding to the securing of the vote by many workers in 1867. In 1886, Mann entered the struggle against unemployment and for free speech and participated in the Bloody Sunday March the following year. 1886 was a busy year. He shared a platform with Eleanor Marx and Karl Kautsky to celebrate the commune. Also, during this period, he worked at his trade alongside a man called Victor Delahaye. Delahaye had been a communard and on the executive of the First International with Marx. And later, Tom Mann took him as one of the organizers of the dock strike, took him with him. In 1889, he became an inspector with the Shop Hours Regulation Act Committee. It's a form of factory inspector. But he was a natural to lead the great dock strike in 1889. Many firsts are associated with this strike. It was probably one of the two most important in British history. Arguably the other, which was the coal miners strike in the 80s, was one of deep defense against retrenchment and destruction of industry. Whereas the great dock strike of 1889 was of new workers coming into the fray, new generations, new industries, organizing with a, a, a future. The strike demonstrated that any worker could organize and that unions had to adapt to change, to this change and government had to adapt as well. The unions used public opinion when they mobilized these mass marches from the East End into the city and they lent on international solidarity, famously the money that came into the strike from Australia to keep it going. They had lay leaders on the job, mass disciplined picketing. In fact, pickets were drilled by ex-artillery officers. During the strike, man carried not one, but two pistols and he used them both. And he was often set upon by company thugs. In Hobsbawm's study of waterside unionism, he draws attention to the crucial need in this period for a systematic body of strategic and tactical thinking about labor movements. This came from Tom Mann. Without great fanfare, the strike underlined the leading role of the working class in any social change that was to come. Of it, he said, it is revolt and live or be content and die. And a people who can read and reflect upon the daring deeds of our ancestors in throwing off the yoke of the tyrants are not people to quietly submit. So after that strike, the working class was never the same. The unions were never the same but neither was government or the state the same. So before the strike, he'd begun to help draw the London Trades Council into the struggle for the eight hour day. 
and he made the 1890 May Day March one of the most significant in the history of trade unionism. He had to use mounted stewards to bring his new trade unionists from the East End into line at the gathering at Hyde Park. But of that gathering, Engels said, what would I give if Marx had lived to see this awakening? In his early days, man was influenced by Christian socialism and even considered going into the priesthood. His embrace of science and encounters with the likes of Bradlaugh and Annie Besant saw him abandon these beliefs, but not their moral dimension. This was a period when advanced workers were moving from liberalism to a tentative and bare bones socialism, and the strike made him a household name in working class areas. In 1892, a Royal Commission on Labour was established. It's probably the most influential gathering of its kind in, the, in, the, in industrial relations. A man was selected by the TUC to put the workers case. So he represented the working class on the Royal Commission, along with some others. He started by fight, fighting for a legal eight hour day. Mann saw the possibility of state advance, which was kind of set out in the submissions, but he believed that unions needed to be sovereign and engage in economic struggle and political campaigning without renouncing their independence of action. And of course he was tested straight away because they offered him a cabinet post as secretary of the new Labour Department. But he turned it down because he said, I'd rather be identified with workers outside, rousing them to make the fullest use of that department. The commission sat for four years and Mann produced a pro-worker minority report, which makes really radical proposals, including turning the docks of London, which were then the biggest in the world, into a publicly owned co-op and he argued for the nationalization of the rail system. In 1893, he became secretary of the London Reform Union. And in 1895, he helped found and became the first general secretary of the Independent Labour Party and very close to Keir Hardy. And he fought parliamentary elections as well in 1895, 1896 and 1897. In 1896, he was instrumental in creating an international federation of ship, dock and river workers, helping to organize solidarity with strikes of dockers in Hamburg. During a visit, he was arrested and deported from Germany. Excuse me, the dog is crying. There you go, that's him sorted. So a modern industrial and worker led socialism was beginning to take shape, though he was a member of the Fabians at the same time, which had a middle class influence. His experience of the Royal Commission convinced him of the need to struggle for reform, which is why he shifted to the ILP. But he could also quickly see the dangers of incorporation and he became a founder delegate to the Second International. In 1900, he had a bit of a midlife crisis, taking up chicken farming, which is uh, even more difficult to fathom because he was a lifelong vegetarian and a member of the Humanitarian League. But he also bought a pub in Maiden Lane, just off Trafalgar Square, where he was successfully prosecuted for watering down the workers' beer. A sad episode. After that, he set sail for New Zealand and then Australia, where he was engaged as an organiser for the Australian Labour Party, which had had a very early Labour government. Amidst dramatic organising drives and strike movements, including the gold mines of Kalgoorlie, he wrote a pamphlet, Socialism. And one of the things about man is that he would crystallise his ideas and then become a pamphleteer, which was a tradition going back to, to the English Civil War. And he is associated with four or five of the most seminal works in British Labour movement uh, uh, pamphleteering. In socialism, he casts aside some of the views he once espoused. Um, Australia, for example, 
was uh, a, a huge country, but with a small population. So it became clear to him that capitalism rather than population size lay at the root of hunger and poverty. So that was Malthus dealt with. And he writes about the influence of Darwin and Marx and evolution, dis distancing himself from religion. But there was a new element, and bear in mind this is in 1905, even before the Russian Revolution. He's, he wrote, it's a common thing for some people to speak very favorably of socialism and very unfavorably of communism. The reason for this is that so few understand what communism is, even though it is the full realization of the collectivist ideal. Leading a giant miners strike at Broken Hill, he then found himself banned from speaking in the whole of South Wales. And this led to coal miners founding a Tom Man train, which was a network of secret routes that was used to ferry him round uh, uh, his speaking engagements. He's best remembered for the strike of armed miners at Broken Hill. Um, and uh, this was the first time actually that he was involved in violence, whether or not it was agreed by the union, dynamite was used and people did get hurt on all sides. Um, he wasn't a pacifist in matters of class war and at one point was arrested and banned from the state. He was acquitted, but he had to leave Australia and was never allowed to return again. On the way back, he stopped off in South Africa and in Paris to discuss syndicalism, which led him to the view that the function of industrial unionism is to build up an industrial republic inside the shell of the political state in order that when the industrial republic is fully organized, it may crack the shell of the political state and step into its place. He started a new publication called The Industrial Syndicalist and was very quickly drawn into a major strike that lasted 72 days in Merseyside of transport workers, which involved uh, Churchill sending a gunboat up the, the Mersey and the newspapers calling Tom Mann the dictator of Merseyside. And it was the, the experience of that strike that began to shift him from pure syndicalism. A couple of years later, he visited America um, at the, the invitation of the Trade Union Education League, which was a syndicalist movement established by the giant of American organized labor, William Z. Foster. But he returned to join the British Socialist Party and became a powerful voice against its early support for the war. That was later overturned. Again, he was tried and acquitted on sedition. And at the end of the war, at the age of 63, he stood and won the first ever elected post of the Amalgamated Engineering Union, which was at its time, at this time, the most advanced trade union in the world. In fact, it was the one on which Lenin said he based the idea of democratic centralism. And the orientation of that union was to establish shop floor representation and democracy. But it wasn't lost on the government um, that there was a revolutionary at the helm of the union that was so important to manufacturing and exports. All his life he had to put up with um, spies and it's interesting I know our party general secretary is doing work on some of the secret service files that exist on leading communists. The only one that is exempted from the, the traditional process is that of Tom Mann and his has been locked away in, in a special uh, cabinet, um, possibly because there's a, there was a thought that he was um, active on behalf of the Soviet Union, which is something that he came to later. So he was an early adopter of the Russian Revolution. Uh, he took part in the Leeds Convention. And then in 1920, he took on a new role as the founder of the Communist Party and of the Red International of Labour Unions. He sat on its seven person presidium and at early congresses met Trotsky and Lenin. He toured Russia with the Russian president Kalinin and established a famine relief fund. In 1921, he took in a leading role along with Harry Pollitt in the hands off Russia movement 
and in the same year ex accepted honorary presidency of the Young Communist League. In 22, he was the lead spokesman for the engineering lockout, but was called away to South Africa to agitate for those arrested during the Great Miners' Strike, and a good number of those strike leaders were hung despite his in intervention. In Britain, he became head of the minority movement, which was an all Britain grouping of radicals and revolutionaries in the unions, pressing for change in policy and structure. And this was led by the Communist Party. And at the same time, served as president of the National Unemployed Workers Movement. Many of the NUWM activists, such as Wal Hannington, went on to become important wartime leaders of the union movement. That's in the Second World War, of course. And it's this generation which shaped the modern labor movement. Mann missed the general strike because he was en route to Moscow. He wrote to his partner, Elsie, after all that, we must take great care and no publicity. I may send an occasional postcard with a non-committal sentence that all's well, but shall not be able to do more for a while. In fact, he missed Moscow and went to Vladivostok en route to Shanghai. There he was to preside over a Congress in Hankow to establish a Pacific Red International of Labour Unions, which would cover Malaysia, Australia, Russia, Japan, Korea, Java, the Philippines and China. It was a very complex assignment, especially as he was so well known. Um, in Hong Kong, he marched at the head of a 40,000 strong demonstration of workers, of dock workers and soldiers to protest against the landing of occupying troops in Shanghai. Many of those troops were British and Empire forces. And in Parliament, his patriotism was questioned. Mann established a hands-off China movement to mirror the hands-off Russia movement. And he wrote, the East and West must come together. The colonial and semi-colonial peoples must be catered for as thoroughly as any others. Whether black, brown, white or yellow, there is room for all in the trade union movement of the world's workers. He thought that going to China um, was for him the most unique, eventful and varied journey of his life. He returned to campaign for Sacco and Vanzetti. He was arrested in Belfast and deported. He was arrested in South Wales and acquitted. You're talking about a 70 year old man now. In 1932, aged 76, he was arrested and imprisoned in London during the National Hunger March, again for sedition, which was a serious charge. The judge said to him on sentencing, someone your age should know better. Man responded, sir, the longer I live and the more I see here and around the world, I know my course is right. In 1933, he became the first president of Marx Library. In 34, he was arrested and put on trial in Cardiff with Harry Pollitt, charged under a law dating back to Edward III, that's 700 years. And later that year, he was deported from Canada. In England, he sought to enlist in the international brigades at the age of 80. Pollitt personally intervened to stop this but the only, the only way he could stop him was by doing a deal so that the name of the first volunteers brigade that went to Spain was called the Tom Man Centuria. And his last years were spent as a party organizer. In 1941, Pollitt revealed that Mann had been a member of the Central Committee and the Executive Committee of the party up until 1938. But of course, as a result of the mass arrests of 1925, names were not made public. So even many party members didn't know his leadership role. On his death, Ben Tillett said, man never lowered the red flag. He just attempted to plant it in impossible places. Man's theory changes through practice. His view of the potential of unions is evidenced in the eight hour movement. You, you could argue that's still an unresolved issue. He realized the power of the state and sought to work it from within 
that was the royal commissions then to remould it through social democracy and municipal gas and water socialism, which was the ILP, then impose a new version from without, which was syndicalism, and then through communism to break and rebuild the state in another way to serve the working class's interests. His, habit, his theories had a habit of influencing all around him. Asked to define communism, he said, William Morris always advocated the vital necessity for the workers themselves to control the work they do. The only possibility for people to become artists again, as our fathers in the Middle Ages certainly were, will be when all responsibility for the entire output of wealth is claimed and discharged by the workers who will form the community. I think that the lifespan of man his changing concepts, which often led the way for the entire movement, demonstrate a legacy that we should embrace and which can be effectively used to educate a new generation of activists. Mm -hmm.